Uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the, today uh, a lifelong friend. Uh, Samia Mehrez is professor of Arabic literature and is the founding director of the Center for Translation Studies at AUC. She has published widely in the fields of modern Arabic literature, post-colonial literature, translation studies, gender and culture studies. Ibrahim Nagy, a belated visit is her most recent book. With Samia here today, I would like to take you back to 1998, the year Arab World Books was born. I was living in Geneva at the time, and in November 1998, I added a forum to this website. Uh, that year um, marked the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we launched our online debate around the seminar I attended at the UN. It was the seminar of Islamic commentaries on the UDHR enriching the, univers the universality of human rights. The following month in December 1998, we debated academic freedom and freedom of expression. At the time, Samia was at the heart of the crisis surrounding the teaching of Muhammad Shukri's al khubz al-Hafi. This is well documented in one of her many great books, Egypt's Culture Wars. A heated debate over academic freedom and freedom of expression soon spread worldwide. And I'm glad that our debate corner played some part, however small, in supporting this case. Tonight is our eighth episode in a new series of conversations with Arab and international writers. These conversations aim to explore the motivation, process, and outcomes of a writer's journey and shed light on the values and experiences that are common to writers and readers across the world. Egyptian author Muhammad Taufi will host and moderate the discussion. Thank you all for participating and have a good evening. Thank you for that, Amani. Uh, Samia, welcome. It's a great pleasure, as always, to have this conversation. Uh, we will start off by a, 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 a brief conversation uh, between Samia and myself, and then we'll open, up, open it up to uh, a discussion, uh, remarks, questions, uh, whatever anyone uh, wants to uh, uh, participate with. Uh, we hope to wrap this up in about 90 minutes. Samia, uh, rather than pursue a narrow academic line, you have chosen to write and edit some of the most creative works on uh, Egyptian society, literature, history, as well, of course, as the, the uh, important subject of translation. Why? this uh, sweeping and diverse approach. Okay, uh, first uh, let's um, begin with thanks because that is always very important to acknowledge friends' support um, in whatever you do. So allow me to begin with that before I respond to your question. I want to thank Emane, both of you Amani and Muhammad for hosting me tonight. Uh, I'm honored and I, I want to seize this opportunity to salute you, Amani, uh, for the wonderful work you continue to do as ambassadors, uh, not just for Arabic literature and Arab writers and culture, but for global communication and interaction. I think this is a marvelous endeavor. And I know how much work, energy, creativity, persistence, and commitment it has involved over the many years that your thriving website has existed. So thank you for your very hard work. It is much appreciated. And you, Mohammed, I'm delighted to be in conversation with you, a schoolmate, a dear friend, and an exceptional novelist whose work I have taught, lectured, and written about. Um, I'm equally proud to have hosted you at the Center for Translation Studies at AUC uh, and to have had the privilege of including your inspiring essay on self-translation in the anthology, which we will discuss, I hope, uh, this evening. 
that was published by the Center in 2019 under the title In the Shoes of the Other Interdisciplinary Essays in Translation Studies from Cairo. So thank you both for having me. And uh, we can now, I guess, begin the conversation. In you, yes, thank you. This is the cover of the book. Uh, thank you for putting that up. Um, so your first question about my the, the, the sort of eclectic nature of my writing, um, I think it's an interesting question coming from you, Muhammad Taufi, given how many hats you have worn during your own career, you know, from law to engineering, to diplomacy, to creative writing. So it says something about um, how we, you know, how we pursue uh, our interests really throughout life. I think that is important and very important. And you are one uh, who has discovered that and who has uh, made decisions, very important decisions about that. Um, but let me answer your question then um, as best I can. I'm a comparatist by training. Um, by the time I was getting ready to do my master's degree at AUC, the English department, where I had just graduated with a BA, was getting ready to shed its Englishness, right? And to adopt a new identity. Um, it became the Department of English and Comparative Literature. This was in the late 70s. All right, so a long, very long time ago. Uh, and that wasn't even the beginning of the process. This development meant two things. Um, one, that the boundaries between fields of knowledge and specializations were being, were shifting, right? And that uh, two, number two, given the, the shift in boundaries, that the shift will impact, therefore, how new generations of scholars and researchers are going to form. Yeah. If people can all new themselves, uh, because it, yeah because it helps. Uh, yeah. Nadua. Could you please yeah. mute? Nashua, yeah. could you please mute yourself? Because otherwise we can hear what's happening around you. So as I was saying, you know, uh, this is part of really of, of a historic development, an important development within the academy itself that will impact the, the new generations of scholars who are coming into different fields of specialization. So what I'm trying to say basically is that my own writing reflects this shift, this shift in the history of the academy. Uh, I am not alone in this. If you look at other people's work during the same time span, you will see that they also um, are doing pretty much what I try to do in a very modest uh, way. Additionally, uh, being a, comparis a comparatist essentially means that you are bound to become eclectic, right? Um, the field of comparative literature very quickly outgrew itself. It outgrew itself. Uh, one doesn't and can't read uh, literary texts in vacuum anymore, right? Even though we were trained for years uh, to read them as such and to pay attention solely to the text uh, itself, uh, its form, its language, its style, aesthetics uh, do this anymore, given the changes that have happened. So various schools of theory came to provide us all 
as incoming researchers and scholars with new perspectives on these very same literary texts that we were taught to deal with as texts, in fact, uh, and to situate them, therefore, within historical, ideological, political, social, and aesthetic perspectives, uh, from structuralism to post-structuralism, Marxist theory, uh, deconstruction, post-colonial theory, feminist studies, gender studies, semiotics, translation studies, queer theory, name it. You know, these were all at our fingertips as emerging uh, scholars uh, who were seeking to deal with the perspectives. The theory was actually, theories uh, in the plural were actually offering us. And so the world, not just my own writing and my writing is part of it, had become interdisciplinary. And, and therefore my writing is a reflection of, of, of this development within the academy and within various fields of knowledge. Um, finally, I think that my training as a comparatist also meant that I would be interested in other cultural fields of production, the visual arts, education, film, media, television, and, and comparing uh, different fields of cultural production and cultural producers allows one, I think, to see a lar much larger picture. Uh, you begin to uh, see reoccurring patterns, uh, similarities, so, um, parallel issues and problems. And that is what my work naturally became, I think as a compatis. Thank you. I mean, uh, th th you mentioned this eclectic approach and uh, I noticed that uh, the same approach was the, you, you use the same approach uh, in uh, your capacity as a director. Of course, you founded the AUC Center for Translation Studies and you directed it for over a decade. Now, the, the, the public lectures that you organized were absolutely fascinating because of, of, of the same mindset, uh, a very, very uh, broad-based uh, approach to translation. And, and of course, in the shoes of the other is, is a fantastic uh, volume really because it deals with translation from so different, so, so many different uh, angles. Uh, so, so can you share with us some of your thoughts on the importance of translation studies and the importance of translation as a whole? Thank you for uh, bringing up uh, this question and for the wonderful things you have just said about the center and its endeavors. The center is now closed, so people should know that. Um, it was an administrative decision uh, at AUC. I, I regret the decision, but you know, this is what institutions do sometimes. Um, we all know that. Uh, however, uh, let me address the question itself um, and begin by saying that again, I was schooled in translation studies as an interdisciplinary field already as a graduate student at AUC. So it's not my vision, you know, I, it was natural that in thinking about establishing a center of translation studies, I would call upon what I learned from my own teachers at the university. You know, that this is a field that is, you know, multidisciplinary and will open up to so many uh, possibilities. So when I actually set it up, set up the center in 2009, translation studies had become one of the most vibrant and most, you know, developing, growing uh, fields of knowledge. Scholars from very different 
disciplines were already reflecting on and writing about um, the impact of translation on the social, cultural, aesthetic, political, and even economic and scientific fields. And that is very important uh, because we never recognize this when we, uh, in our daily lives, and translation is part of our daily lives, actually. And I think that um, Mona Baker, in her preface to the uh, anthology you just referred to, In the Shoes of the Other, um, Interdisciplinary Essays in Translation Studies from Cairo, in her preface, Mona Baker says, you know, translation has become a late motif of contemporary scholarship. And I would say that this is true across the disciplines, whether it be in the humanities, social sciences, or the hard sciences as well. I mean, uh, how can you think about, when you think about science, you have to think about the history of transla translation in the sciences. When you think about aesthetics, you have to think about the history of translation of aesthetics. When you think of philosophy, you have to think about the translation of, you know, within the field of philosophy. It's always a carrying across between cultures over, uh, over time. Not only has translation studies created actually a, a, a critical alliance with many fields, diverse fields uh, of uh, specialization and knowledge, such as post-colonial theory, gender studies, media studies, film studies, linguistics, minority languages, but it did all of that. So it sort of, it's, it's uh, sort of sucks up all of these disciplines and produces these, um, it's like an octopus, you know, then it sort of has all of these various tentacles that spread all over uh, these other uh, disciplines. Uh, but, but also interestingly, translation studies, thanks to the globalization of debates about and around translation, um, becomes more self-reflective, right? And self-critical um, in its own Eurocentrism because it does begin as a Eurocentric um, field, right? Um, and this, the fact that it is becomes more self-critical uh, and self-reflective means that it's going to have to rewrite or uh, rethink its own history, which I think is, is fascinating. Uh, and, and this leads to the inclusion, therefore, of marginalized um, traditions and uh, many uh, practices of translation that are beyond the sort of initial Eurocentric focus of translation studies. And hence, it's, it, it continues to sort of be a magnet, if you will but also uh, to refract uh, a tremendous lot of interesting ways and perspectives uh, on trans the very processes of translation. So therefore, you know, translation studies is not a coincidence and it's not a vogue, it's not that it's fashionable. Um, um, I think it's really integral to our very, our very existence as human beings human beings are translating beings all the time in their gestures, signs, movements, language. I mean, we're inhabited by translation. It's unavoidable, but we seldom take the time to think about this um, and how translation permeates our lives all the time. Uh, on the everyday, in the everyday. I mean, when I say, when you say to someone, what do you mean? This person has to actually translate what they're saying. You know, when I do this, I mean, I'm translating something. It's, it's all 
over there. It's in us. It inhabits us. And we sort of um, send it back out in, into the world. Um, so the center really was founded with all of this in the background, my own legacy of what I learned from my teachers, but also what was happening in the field and what it inspired. Uh, um, and additionally, I worked at AUC, right? I worked at the American University in Cairo. How translational can that be? Right. It's an institution that, whose mission really is this connection or the translation between, you know, what the American sort of liberal arts uh, tradition can can give as it uh, fosters and uh, salutes and you know, Arabic culture. And so this already within the university's mission, there is this translational uh, moment. But beyond the mission, I was capitalizing as director of the center about on realities on the ground. AUC faculty are all plurilingual. And so are, is the student body, you know, every single faculty member is at least bilingual, if not beyond. And our students predominantly speak three to four languages. And, and, and uh, as I started this adventure of the center, I realized that every discipline calls on translation or is involved in translation from the computer scientists who are engaged with and in, uh, you know, uh, 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 machine translation and machine assisted translation to, of course, the more sort of um, tra traditional conventional venues of literary translation. But law, law, we have hosted people from across the campus. Uh, and it was a discovery for me personally, to come to realize that AUC is all about translation because of the capacity of its faculty and its student body. Not only that, but also the supporting Cairo community that uh, interacted very actively with our uh, lecture series and the workshops that the um center offered and beyond that the national interest and our cooperation with the uh, national center for translation at a certain moment in time to create a, a very sort of uh, ambitious project that we called the house of translation that would be a joint venture between the uh, center for translation studies at AUC and the National Center for Translation in Egypt that is part of the Ministry of uh, uh, Culture. Um, so that's what we capitalize on. Now to address, I'd, I'd like to sort of, uh, if you time allows it, I'd like to sort of use the anthology itself as a testament to the um, interdisciplinarity and broad spectrum uh, uh, that translation studies as a field uh, brings to us, uh, all of us in our uh, various disciplines. So if you would allow me, I'm going to read from the, the description of what the anthology uh, in the shoes of the other um, interdisciplinary um, essays in translation studies from Cairo, what this volume includes. So for, for you to see the spectrum uh, that is remains actually limited, it could be could have been much broader, but this is what 
with 35 participants, all very distinguished names from various fields uh, across the board. Uh, so let me just um, uh, read to you that part one in the anthology, uh, the translator memory, memoirs, testimonies and reflections includes testimonies and reflections by major translators from Arabic into English, but also French and Italian into Arabic. Part two of the anthology that is uh, titled Translation, Migration and Identity includes essays that dwell primarily on the relationship between translation, power and identity in a globalized world. Part three that is entitled Literary Translation Challenges and Opportunities focuses on the shifting pressures on Arabic literature through a wide variety of literary traditions and texts. Part four that is titled On Carrying Across Languages, Cultures and Registers engages multiple strategies and st uh, challenges of carrying across from one culture to another, various linguistic idioms, registers and metaphors and how these travel between different languages, Arabic, French, Arabic, English, French, Turkish, German, both synchronically and diachronically, and within different contexts of power. Um, part five, translation across disciplines, includes essays that explore, explore the political and cultural impact and value of a wide range of disciplinary translations from French and Russian Orientalist writings to Western philosophy, the intradisciplinary translations of Islamic studies, the role of cultural critics as translators, and the role of visual arts as a translational mode uh, and strategy. Part six, which is the fi final uh, part that is entitled The Stage, the Screen, and the languages in between includes hands-on essays by scholars and practitioners of translation in the visual and performative fields of theater, cinema, and dubbing and subtitling. And I'm happy that Zina Mubarak is with us tonight. She is a leading uh, figure, of course, in the area of uh, dubbing and subtitling in particular. And so, as you can see just from the, the, the contents, and here I give a very broad uh, view of what's in it, you know, how the spectrum, the umbrella that translation studies can actually encompass. Thank you for that, Samia. Thank you for sharing uh, your vision and, and, and I have to take this opportunity really to express how much I appreciated uh, what you have done during the period in which the Center for Translation Studies was active. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it played a central role in uh, the, the, the cultural scene in Cairo. And, uh, and your vision, as you have expressed it now, was, was really uh, demonstrated and manifested in many different ways. Uh, uh, and and I, just, I just want to, to express how much I appreciate that. And I've appreciated your role uh, before uh, establishing the center, uh, the approach you took to uh, to writing and and uh, literature and and connecting uh, this connecting uh, Egypt with the world through this very important uh, medium of of literature uh, and and also I'm sorry uh, that the uh, uh, the center was uh, was closed was uh, it it did play a wonderful role. And uh, I hope, uh, uh, I look forward to uh, another effort in that direction. I hope the AUC will, will uh, come to see the benefit of that. Uh, 
And certainly the idea of the AUC having sort of partnerships with different uh, Egyptian entities, I think that's a, that's a fantastic, fantastic approach. Uh, having said that, uh, are you satisfied with uh, the, the, the selection uh, of the quality and quantity of works translated into Arabic and from Arabic to other languages? In your, in your view, what, what needs to be improved? This is a book, it's not a question. I mean, you know, you're asking me something vast and I know the perfect person who can respond uh, to your question. And I would like to include him tonight because he is a very, very dear friend and a partner, really, uh, the great, the one and only Humphrey Davis, uh, who has left us uh, a couple of months ago. And let me just say why I want for Humphrey to represent, to speak on my behalf uh, in response to this question. Humphrey Davis inherited from Dennis Johnson Davis the seat of the prime translator of Arabic fiction into English. Uh, and in this role, he has been absolutely superb. Uh, he has at least 30 works to his name from more than one Arab country, covering more than one moment in Egyptian letters, uh, aesthetics, uh, writing. And so Humphrey is, is a huge loss to uh, the field of translation, really. But beyond this, Humphrey was a staunch supporter of the Center for Translation Studies. There is not one time that I called upon him for a letter. And I think, you know, he, he you know, he wrote so many that it must have been, you know, terrible for him to do, but he promptly wrote them every time I called for his support. And I will remain forever grateful for this uh, support. But Humphrey was also very dedicated to the center. He was a backbone. He was my partner. He attended every lecture. And when he didn't, he wrote to me to apologize as if he were in a classroom, you know, and say, Samia, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be there, but I have to be out of town as if he needed to do that. And when, when he did attend, he made sure to write back in to, to critique or to, you know, to hail uh, the lecturers that he had uh, witnessed. And so he was a companion uh, for 12 years uh, in the center. And um, I, 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 if anybody can answer the question that you've just asked, about you know the place of Arab Arabic literary translations, um, I think it would be Humphrey. And the the part of the video that we're going to play now is actually the speech that he gave at the launch of the anthology that we just spoke about in the shoes of the other interdisciplinary um, uh, essays uh, Cairo, uh, and he was part of a panel and he deftly sort of summarizes the situ this very complex situation that you're asking me uh, to respond to. And given how, uh, you know, eloquent his uh, speech is and the fact that he really should have been with us uh, tonight and is not, uh, I would like to pay tribute uh, to Humphrey by sharing what he had to say uh, about uh, uh, the field uh, tonight with you all. Thank you for that, Samia. Humphrey Davis was certainly uh, a very important figure in, in uh, translating Egyptian literature and Arabic 
literature into into English, and and uh, certainly uh, I'm sure we'll all uh, benefit from from listening to him in this in this regard. Uh, just give me a second. Let me see if I can get this organized. Just give me a second, I'll have it. Have it there in one second. Technology. Uh, just one more, just give me a second because Now I can get it. And thank you to the Center for Literary Translation for 10 years of interesting, provocative, and enjoyable lectures, and many other activities. Um, Dennis Johnson Davies, whose spirit, I hope, hovers benignly over this occasion. In fact, I'm sure that it does, having been invoked specifically by Samia at the beginning, was the first person to make a concerted effort to introduce Arabic literature to English readers. And let me say here that, uh, faced by this wide field of uh, translation as we have had it laid out for us so skillfully tonight, I'm going to restrict myself to literary translation from English, from Arabic into English, which is the furrow that I personally plow in that big field. Uh, Dennis had at least one notable success, commercially speaking. The publication of his translation of Tayyib Saleh's migration, Season of Migration to the North, which a few years ago found a place in the Penguin Classic series. All the same, Dennis never ceased to emphasize the extreme efforts he had to go to to interest English language publishers in Arabic literature. The short lifespan of series intended to raise the profile of Arabic literature or the failure of most of what he translated to reach a large audience. Even 15 years ago, some 55 years after Dennis made his first translation, I vividly remember the dampening effect it had on me when Mark Lintz, then director of the AUC Press, told me and a colleague that he hoped we didn't expect to make a living out of this. Though a degree of professional self-interest uh, may have lain behind his remark, it echoed the generally pessimistic outlook of the time regarding the viability from a publisher's perspective of Arabic novels in translation. Today, I believe the position of literary translation from Arabic into English is fundamentally stronger, and the quality and importance of Arabic literature much more widely re recognized in the English-speaking world. 
here I, I should emphasize also that I speak only really of translation from English into Arabic. I do not know much about the, the situation of translation from Arabic into uh, French or German or Italian, though I think that things probably go even better there. Let me cite just one indicator of the improvement in the position of Arabic literature translated into English since Dennis's time. The most recent list of works in the World Bookshelf, published and supported financially by Penn UK, the British arm of the Worldwide Writers Association, contained 24 books, of which four <clears throat> were translations from Arabic. Only Spanish scored an equal number, and other languages were represented by smaller numbers. Obviously, it is too early to say adieu to French literature, or sayonara to Japanese, as players in the English book market and it may have been a bit of a blip. Nonetheless, such strong representation of Arabic writing and translation on a prestigious list from an organization at the heart of the English literary world would have been unthinkable even a decade ago. The causes behind this upsurge are multiple and complex, and I do not, do not want to get into them in this brief presentation. For now, let me just note a few milestones along the road. Obviously, Nagib Mahfouz being awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1981 is one, though it wasn't followed up by much further exposure. More significant, in my opinion, in terms of opening a new audience for Arabic literature was its first true crossover popular success, Al Aswani's Yaqubian building which, for the first time, saw an Arabic novel sell tens of thousands of copies in English. The same period saw the establishment of Banipal magazine, the first English language magazine devoted to publishing excerpts from modern Arabic and promoting, the, and promoting Arabic literature in English in general. A plethora of e-signs and blogs some dedicated primarily to literature, some general, now exist that present Arabic literature, Arabic writing, either alone or on, alongside translations from other languages. Arab Lit Cooperative, Words Without Borders, Jadaliya, The Common, Arab Hyphen, etc. Literary prizes, some of large monetary value, have joined the veteran AUC's Nagib Mahfouz Prize, awarded since 1996. Of these, the most famous is the International Prize for Arab Fiction, commonly referred to as the Arab Booker. Though the influence of book prizes on literary production in Arabic is considered by some to be negative, they have undoubtedly helped to raise the profile of the winning books, which are frequently thereafter translated. Importantly, too, I think, this increased presence of Arabic literature in the, in the English language book market has been expanded since 2013 to include pre-modern works. The Library of Arabic Literature, a series of dual Arabic-English texts with translations, now carries some 25 titles, ranging from pre-Islamic poetry to Muhammad al muwalhi it is now possible to walk into a bookstore in London and find a, book a bookshelf full of Arabic classics with the translation alongside the original text. Produced to a high standard in both literary and technical terms and aimed at the non-specialist reader. I do not want to paint an absolutely rosy picture. More Arabic works have been shortlisted than have actually won prizes, though being on a shortlist is itself a distinction and should result in increased attention and sales. Not all titles, even critically acclaimed ones, pay enough to cover publishers' costs. Often such works are carried by other assets in the publishers' lists. However, it is, that is also true of difficult works from other languages. 
There is also a paradox. In this age of discursive overkill, statements such as translation is the key cultural artifact of our age are bandied about, and this, of course, is inspiring for us translators. However, rates paid for translation uh, from any language remain low. Um, Dr. Maurice has pointed out the situation here in Egypt. I can assure him that it isn't that much better elsewhere. I can think of at least a dozen, whereas, sorry, despite this, one more factor in the improved reception of Arabic literature is the greater number of competent translators, many of whom are young. I can think of at least a dozen, whereas 20 years ago, one would have been hard pressed to think of more than one. That one being, of course, Dennis Johnson Davies. The expansion and improvement of Arabic teaching in major universities around the world, including AUC's Center for the Study of Arabic Abroad, has certainly played a role in this. This brings us more or less up to 2019 and a very satisfactory year it has been so far from this perspective. In May, Marilyn Booth's translation of Jurha Al-Harthi's Celestial Bodies won the International Booker Prize. The first time that an Arabic novel has won a major prize in competition with works from other literatures in English translation. In addition, Larry Price's translation of Khalid Khalifa's Death is Hard Work was one of the four finalists for the USA's National Book Award in the translation category. Though her translation of Khalid Khalifa's Death is, Death is Hard Work did not win, this constitutes another significant moment. Given the high prestige and profile of the prize, which has been described as the Oscars of Arabic literature, of American literature, uh, all of this amounts perhaps to saying no more than that Arabic literature has gained a toehold in the English book market. But that toehold toe is significant. It means that the existence of a thriving modern Arabic literature is recognized outside the academy, that that literature is afforded respect, and that it is read outside of its home territory. And that is something new and something to celebrate. Thank you very much. That was certainly uh, a very comprehensive uh, uh, point of view that I think uh, covers a lot of, of ground. Uh, we still have a few more minutes for this conversation, yeah, yeah, Samia. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me just say that uh, Humphrey's uh, speech that night was titled um, in his uh, great wit and humor uh, was titled You've Come a Long Way Baby uh, and the reference of course is to the the translation translation of Arabic fiction a very optimistic um, uh, outlook on the future but and I also uh, think that the fact that he sees the the role of the uh, younger translators uh, beyond the sort of solitary role of Dennis Johnson Davis, who was reputed to be the man who single-handedly translated Arabic literature, uh, is very important. That we now have a, a, a wonderful pool uh, of committed and gifted uh, translators who are taking on this field. I mean, I ca we can't sort of say that we uh, occupy a major uh, place uh, on the world map. However, I think I really think that things are changing and changing for the better. As optimistic as 
Humphrey uh, has been about this process. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, I, I have one last question, uh, but certainly a very important question regarding your uh, uh, book that's just out, congratulations. Uh, a very, very interesting work. Uh, uh, it's, it's called uh, Ibrahim Nagy, A Belated Visit. And uh, now this is quite an interesting departure from your previous work. On, on the one hand, it was written in Arabic, uh, but also more importantly, it's a, a, a sort of biography or a biographical picture of your grandfather and uh, the, the, the great Egyptian poet. Uh, but of course, at heart, it's really a, a memoir. Uh, in, in this work, you expose topics that must be very sensitive to you. Uh, you, you describe uh, uh, the personal life as well, of course, as, as the, the, the literary life of your uh, grandfather. Uh, can you share with us briefly the experience, your experience in writing this, this book. Did you feel that you had this sort of load that you needed to get off your chest? Uh, and did it arouse any sensitivities among your uh, wider family members? Thank you for asking this question. I am very happy about um, the, um, the feedback that I have been receiving since the publication of this work. I never expected it. It was, um, I was venturing, as you say, into new grounds. This is my first book in Arabic and um, Arab critics can be very cruel um, and very demanding and uh, very scrutinizing. But so far, <laughs> I have uh, been uh, left off the hook. Um, it, um, it's a work that uh, I am wrote. I call it a belated visit to my grandfather but it's a visit that occurred at the right time, as I have said in, in several, uh, on several, several other occasions. Uh, I could not have written this book uh, before this moment in my life uh, because I needed to have journeyed uh, as far as I have in my own career to be able to uh, pay this visit to my grandfather, with who, who I never met. He died two years before I was born. He loomed very large uh, on my life and, and, and future. There were expectations from my family that I would become him or something like him um, for many years, and that did not happen. It, it did happen, but in in different ways. I'm not a poet. Uh, I, 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 I chose not to deal with poetry uh, in my career, perhaps because he loomed so large on my own development. Uh, I sort of uh, chose to inhabit a parallel space to his without having to deal with him. It was easy to ignore him because I didn't know him. So he, uh, you know, remained that uh, portrait uh, or image on my parents' uh, wall in their apartment. Um, and um, so anyway, so it's a, it's a, it was a very, uh, it's a, it's an adventure, but also a, a coincidence, uh, this book, because I, uh, 
the book is um, sort of uh, based on a finding uh, and this find uh, happened when I was cleaning up my late aunt's apartment uh, with my cousin uh, Shahira Abdul Wahid Raneri in the United States. Uh, and we came across two closed envelopes. Uh, and we opened them then and there as we were cleaning everything out, uh, and only to discover that, you know, that there are papers that seemed to be, you know, our grandfather's uh, memoirs, uh, uh, drafts of poetry, uh, unfinished projects, etc. And because Shahira uh, um, left to the U.S. as a child, basically, with her parents who immigrated to the U.S., uh, she, she was not schooled in Arabic. And so she immediately recognized that maybe I would benefit more uh, with, uh, with, uh, to, to, to have these uh, documents. So she gave them to me. And they remained on my ship. On, they had already remained for at least 30 years uh, in my aunt's possession, close as they were. And when they came with me to Cairo and traveled with me in many apartments, they also remained closed for a good 10 years at least. And then when I finally opened them, I discovered that I was in the possession of, you know, one um, beyond the, 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 the um, drafts of his own uh, poetry, uh, and his translations of Shakespeare and his unfinished projects in uh, uh, health medicine, etc. Um, there was a memoir, and it was a rather, it's a personal sort of, of course, as memoirs all, always are. Um, and um, I had to reflect on what do I do with this memoir? It, is this something that I can publish? This is one question. My mother had also given me uh, uh, 28 letters that were exchanged between him and my grandmother uh, over a period of a year and a half, uh, from 1928 to 1930 or so. Um, and I, uh, so these are two, the two intimate, intimate, if you will, uh, documents that in, are in, included in the, in the, in the, in the book, in this recent book. So let me address the uh, letters first. The letters had already been circulating in the public domain because my, both my mother and her sister, Do, Dohei Anegi, uh, my friend and aunt, um, had used repeatedly in the press uh, to defend the, their father and mother against claims that he was unhappy with my grandmother uh, or that he had other you know, important uh, uh, relationships in his life. Um, because they, they used the letters selectively, there uh, was no, uh, I, 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 it, they were able to tell a particular story, right? They were able to say, you know, he was, he loved her. He loved her for 25 years, and here is the documentation. When I uh, got hold of the letters myself, I wanted to sort of um, 
place them in a historical perspective, to read them chronologically. And once you, I did that, I was able to see a very different story between my grandfather and my grandmother. Uh, and, and, and a story that would, ena would enable me to tell something very different from what my mother and my aunt had been trying to propel into the press in defense of their father and mother. And let me say that my relationship to my grandfather and my grandmother is very different from my mother and my aunt. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't know my grandma, and so I took license. I, I wanted to reconstruct the story that they had constructed for themselves to defend a father that they loved and a, and a mother that they loved. Uh, that was not my role. I wanted to read these texts, if I may use the word, which doesn't mean much, you know, uh, objectively, but at least to sort of place them within a historical uh, sequence and to read the relationship differently, uh, which is what I did. And the outcome, of course, tells us, you know what, you know, these uh, letters are testament to the fall of the, of the relationship, not the sort of celebration of this, uh, this uh, love, uh, which is fine, because we also see later on in his memoir that th that love uh, or that bind, let's say, between them never goes away until his death, despite everything that happens in his lifetime. Now, when I come to the memoir, the memoir <clears throat> uh, is already set up for publication by him in his own words. He expects to publish this. And I think that, as I said before, in other uh, meetings with uh, with uh, with friends, that this project of of publishing a memoir uh, fails him, and it fails him because of many uh, terrible uh, circumstances. His health, you know, he he has the he contracts. Uh, uh, TB. He has. He is diabetic. He loses weight. I mean, the, the, his health condition is already, you know, very uh, trying. Uh, his uh, professional uh, career is dwindling. He is being targeted uh, by the institution because he is a doctor poet and. That is not acceptable acceptable to the medical uh, institution, and so he suffers. Uh, he's ostracized because of that, uh, and he tries to make pleas for for his uh, um, uh, encyclopedic knowledge in other fields uh, like psychoanalysis, uh, sociology, translation. But this is not something that the medical institution wants to recognize. So he feels um, out, outcast and, and, and marginalized. Um, but anyway, you know, the, the, the memoirs also include, of course, his uh, um, many relationships. They're not all sort of... Uh, emotional necessarily or romantic. Many of them are important for him because he needs partners in life. Other than my grandmother, who is quite traditional, uh, let's say steady, but traditional, but he needs partners. And some of them are correspondents. Some of them are lovers of his poetry. Some of them are actual relationships or fantasies, but you know, he needs this uh, 
in order to be what he is, a romantic poet. Uh, I'm not a fan of ro romanticism, by the way, and I try very hard to map the differences between us, uh, my grandfather and I, on many uh, levels in the, in the book. Um, but anyway, so even in dealing with his memoir, I am not dealing with secrets. Ibrahim Negi was known to be, you know, uh, a vagabond in as part of his profiles. You know. He loved life. He savored everything that life could give him. And he was very public with all of his vices, if we can call them vices. And I do, at some point, interject and say, what are you doing? What is this? Just to distance myself from his. But there are no secrets. He is a man who had no secrets. So I was never intimidated. I was never, I never um, hesitated, if you will, to bring forth what is in the book because it tells us something about how he, in his own handwriting, lived these moments, which is very different from how people, other people, have represented them. And I would never, let me add, that I would have never written this book without the blessing of my mother, who is the only remaining member of the family, who initially sort of um, had reservations about what I might say. But let me say that the telling the story, hence the importance of storytelling, seduced her to the point that she allowed me with love to say everything that I have said, not only to say, but she actually enjoyed the new image of her father that this book created. Thank you, Sam Samia. What a fantastic story and uh, a great book that I strongly recommend. Uh, let, let us open up the discussion. Who would like to start with, with any comments or questions to Samia? Nahla, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, Dr. Samia. Um, I, I have to say I, I really enjoy your work. Uh, and I'll take you back to an earlier work of yours, uh, uh, Egyptian Writers uh, Between History and Fiction, the essays of you comparing the work of uh, Agib Mahfouz and Allah Ibrahim and Gamal Ghitani. And my question to you would be, if you would reproduce this work, uh, writing about uh, women writers, Egyptian uh, Arab women writers, who would be the three writers that you would pick for such a comparison? And what body, what works would you include in that? Thank you. That's not a fair question. <laughs> but... oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> But let me say that, you know, Latifa Zayed, for example, is inspirational to me uh, on many, many levels, not just literary. Uh, Radu Ashur is another, of course, very important figure. Salwa Bakr uh, is a third writer I, I deeply uh, enjoy and think has a, a, a magnificent uh, a, a, a strategies of uh, storytelling. You asked me for three, here they are. Let me add one more, uh, who is much younger and very different from the three I met, Imen Mircel, who is a, is a poetess, 
on major protests, but whose um, narrative works, I have um, have impacted me very very deeply. Uh, whether it be her work on uh, her motherhood or her work on uh, her latest work on. Uh, um, I mean, these are, for me are because I'm a, I'm I have a not a prejudice, but a, you know my my I, I sort of cling to narrative more than I do to poetry, and I think immense narrative works are amazing. Uh, I and I have already told her, you you know what. You really should be a novelist or a that Yanni. That's how important these two works by Imen are to me. Oh, thank you so much! And actually, I'm I'm really happy because I guess two out of the four writers you mentioned. So thank you very much. I have a, a process question, um, Dr. Methods. You mentioned at the outset, you talked about the, the different uh, mindset toward translation today. How do you approach a work of translation now differently than you might have at the beginning of your career? Translation is not my main uh, vocation, if you will. But I think that, let me just say that one of the things that we I have discovered along the way uh, in directing the center and running workshops with with uh, uh, people in in the Cairo community, but also uh, 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 calling on my students to work collaboratively, uh, is the importance of and this may be it discovery, the importance of collaborative translation. You know, that um, we have always uh, thought of translation as a solitary thing that you do on your own, with your own uh, uh, dictionaries and resources, etc. But through experience, I think, I've come to discover that translation is a collaborative process. And it's at its best as it's at its best when people collaborate and not compete. Um, I've seen this in um, one published work that I worked on with my students um, in 211, immediately after the January 211 uprising in Egypt. And the book was published by AUC Press and is entitled translating Egypt's revolution, the language of Tahrir. And this is a collaborative process uh, project by AUC students who worked together. I forced them to work together. They were reluctant initially. They were, each wanted to work their chapter on their own. And I have one of the authors right here, uh, Chris Combs, who is joining us in the high, Chris. Uh, and um, he is one of the authors of the chapters and they work together. And I think that the chapters have been uh, what they are, have become what they are because of the collaborative uh, energy between the participants in that anthology. Um, I also think that the workshops that we have conducted in the uh, uh, center has, have encouraged people to, to work, uh, to understand the value of collaborative translation. So I think that, you know, uh, if 20 years ago we all wanted to work on our own, alone, and sort of agonize over solutions for the texts we are translating, what I wanted to try to open up is, you know, it's okay for us to work together. We don't have to be, 
you know, we don't have to be the sole author of something, that collaboration sometimes offers us the best solution. And I think that that particular anthology, Translating Egypt's Revolution, is a testament to the value of collaborative uh, translation. Great. We have uh, two questions pending, but we have a follow-up suggestion from Karen. Uh, she's suggesting, let me just read it. Uh, hold on. Anyway, she's, she's, she's suggesting since you referred to uh, Mr. Coombs, if he, if he would like to comment on, uh, on that particular experience, translating Egypt's revolution. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it was um, being here uh, coincidentally in um, 2011, um, it, working on a graduate diploma in Middle Eastern studies, uh, um, when the uh, events of you know 2011 and Tahrir happened, and uh, um, and then, but after that, uh, taking um, a Dr. Samia's uh, seminar was um, you know a, a great experience. I, I by the way, I'm, uh, I um, you know since in the past decade I you know been working for a trade association, but then got tired of that after about six years and returned to studying Arabic uh, and um, to get to a point where I can, um, you know, do something with it uh, professionally. And I'm, this past year, I've been um, studying uh, in the c continuing education school uh, translation. And um, uh, one, I want to say the um, uh, opportunity to, to work with my nine colleagues in, in Samia's seminar, Translating Egypt's Revolution was in working uh, under Samia's mentorship, mentorship was uh, inspiring. And two, I wanna say that um, the, I, I just noted down uh, this quote uh, that uh, collaborative translation is uh, translation at its best and uh, Sammy, I'd, I'd like to say I, I accept that as a as a challenge. I I, I, I hope uh, to um, find another experience uh, collaborating um, in the future. Um, my wife uh, is uh, works in international development. We move around every th few years, and uh, this is one of the reasons I I decided. And I love working with languages. This is one of the reasons I decided to go back to translation and studying Arabic translation. So. Um, yeah, I, I uh, uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the quote of, uh, about a, um, collaborative translation, and I accept that as a challenge. I hope to uh, find a project where I can uh, uh, put that to work uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Fahd? <clears throat> Dr. Fahad Al Nouri from Saudi Arabia. He muted. Is he muted? No, he's not muted. Go ahead. Uh, well, maybe maybe we'll move on to a question uh, by the. Well, I think he's trying to get online. Yes, go ahead. Now you're okay. You're not muted now. Doctor Fahad, tafadar. Okay, let's let let me try and, and uh, as as he 
works out his, the, the technical issue. Let me try and see what DL's question was. Uh, now, let, let, let me read from, from the chat. DL is saying, you are bilingual. Do you find writing in different languages requires different energy and thought processes? This is ahead, question. That's it, yeah. Um, I'm trilingual, but yeah, bilingual, uh, of course. And therefore, you know, different languages require different thought processes. And uh, I must use Muhammad Tawfi as an example, because when he writes in Arabic, he chooses to translate, self-translate, because he understands that whatever he wrote in Arabic cannot just be transferable into English, because the thought process, the language structure, etc., is different. And therefore, you need to rewrite yourself. And this, of course, is something that bilinguals, let's say, understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't reproduce the same work, identical work in a different language, that you need to carry it across, which is what translation is all about, to be able to carry it across to a different audience so that it has the same importance, value, and place in the host culture, as we say. No, I think Dr. Fahd is, is back. Yeah. Uh, can, you, Fahd, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Samia. Um, maybe this is a silly question, and you've been asked before many times. You know the uh, Italian adage, you know, uh, traditori, traditori, translator, yeah. straighter. Um, I mean, uh, although no one can say, I mean, who coined this uh, phrase at first, although it's in Italian. Uh, from your experience, what's your, your input in, uh, in this thing? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we are traitors, which is fine. You know, I think everybody treats translators as traitors. Yeah, that's why they kill them <laughs> in wars, for example. You know, uh, uh, one of the horrific things that we witness in conflicts real conflicts, but let's talk about real life, you know, is that many translators have actually not only risked, but lost, lost their lives because they are translators, because they are, are perceived as traitors working on both sides, for both sides. But that's what translation is all about, I think, um, that you are are always risking something. You're always taking a risk. And if you don't take it, then whatever you do has no taste and does not carry across. Um, so yeah, that's my two, two pennies <laughs> for that. I think we have time for one more uh, question or comment. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, we have Safina Saad, who wants to go back to the question of women's issues. Yes. What? Let me let me try and get the the chat back because I would like to get back to the question on. Egyptian women writers, as it is the focus of my current research. If you would situate the works by Latifa Zayet and Radu Ashur, how would you do so? Would you see Ashur's oeuvre a continuation of Zayet's, or how would you see it? Uh, I would be interested to know your thoughts. I think the projects are parallel, but not uh, identical. I don't see 
Rad Ashur as a continuation of uh, uh, Latifa Zayed. I think they have their parallel projects and they are both worthy of uh, respect and, and, and study and, uh, you know, uh, valuation. But uh, um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Why do we need to see people in other people's footsteps? I think that people launch careers inspired by others, but then they find their own paths and develop in, in very different directions to a great extent. Great, okay. Uh, let's let's have a, a, a quick question from Nahla. Uh, thank you. Uh, I actually would hate for this event to uh, conclude without the mention of your uh, uh, anthology of the uh, the Cairo Literary Atlas. Um, it's it's a fascinating work. Uh, I loved it and. Uh, uh, let me again, like, put a, a a question to you. In a way, is you know, it it also highlighted how centralized Egyptian literature is because of the amount of work. And I'm sure you know there is a lot more that you haven't included. But really, Cairo is in the heart and center of most of the literary work produced in Egypt. So I was wondering again, like, do you think is it possible to reproduce this? for any other city like Alexandria or I don't know what the, or you know the Egyptian uh, uh, Fallahin or like Said I don't know like uh, what are your thoughts about that thank you thank you for bringing up the literary atlas it is one of the dearest uh, and uh, closest uh, projects to my heart I did it uh, again, at a time uh, when I when I had time, it was a sabbatical, so I worked on it with great energy and uh, focus. But let me remind us all that when we refer to Cairo, we say Masr, and in Masr, it is Masr, and and so yeah, you're absolutely right that Cairo is is Egypt uh, uh, to a great extent. But your question about what can we do this to with other uh, cities uh, in Cairo and sort of decentralize uh, this uh, process of representation of the country uh, through its major cities, literary at a literary level, let's say, because that's what the Atlas is about. It's about the representation of Cairo through its literature. Uh, uh, not just uh, sort of the its um, buildings and streets, but yes, these, but as they are represented through literary texts. And I must say that Alexandria is a prime uh, candidate for an atlas uh, li like the literary atlas of Cairo. And I was actually asked at a certain point by AUC Press to produce such an atlas. Unfortunately, or fortunately for Alexandria, the literature on Alexandria is very cosmopolitan and is written in many languages, French, Greek, uh, Italian. Uh, and in order to create the same kind of project for Alexandria, it would have been an enormously costly uh, enterprise for the press because they would have had to seek and get um, permissions to republish all of these works in, in other languages uh, above and beyond all of the Egyptian writers who have written about it, like Alexander Ibrahim Abdel Megid, Edward Harrod, uh, Ali, uh, 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 in, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting his luck, but many residents of Alexandria have written about it in Arabic, and 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 so it would have been a, fa fa uh, a fantastic project, but a very expensive one. So, yeah, and I agree, 
you can write an atlas on Mansura, you can do something on Loso, you can do something on Minya. All of our cities uh, offer us because our writers were initially residents of these cities and have written about them uh, that we can actually go back and trace these literary moments uh, across these cities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Samia. The last question is from Vivian. Now, Vivian says, hello, Dr. Samia. You say that this book, she's referring to uh, the, the, the memoir, that this book is the first you ever wrote in Arabic. Obviously, it is only logical to write this in Arabic. Beforehand, did you make a conscious decision to write in English or was it a result of your education and training and teaching at AUC? In other words, how does a writer decide to address his work to the English speaking community and thus the global community or to his, her own local community? Thank you for the question, Vivian. Um, yes, I, you know, my most of my publications are in English because I teach in an American institution that requires us, let's say, for the purposes of promotion and tenure and very pragmatic uh, things to write in English and to publish in English and to be recognized in the English speaking world. That's a prime consideration. So, you know, you go through your career sort of uh, uh, enslaved by this uh, demand until you get to a moment in your life, which is uh, where I am at today, uh, where you get a sabbatical and you decide, you know what, this time I'm going to write in Arabic because this particular book requires that I write it in Arabic. It cannot be written in English. And uh, so I take this leap and say, all right, I'm going to write this particular book in Arabic. It was an adventure. I'm glad I did it because it's opened up a new world to me, really. Uh, and I'm very uh, grateful to that, to, to COVID-19, <laughs> because it offered me this one year of hibernation with my grandfather and with the material that I needed to work on and, and, and enabled me actually to inhabit him and to re, uh, to inhabit Arabic, you know, as a writer, which was not an easy process, but it did happen. And I'm glad that it happened the way it did. Uh, and so, yeah, now, you know, once you liberate yourself from the academic sort of demands, then you can move more freely, not just between languages, between, but between levels of language uh, with an understanding that you're also addressing different audiences uh, and that you, therefore you need to write differently uh, from what you did as an academic. This is a fantastic note on which we can end our uh, conversation this evening. Uh, I can uh, uh, only say uh, how much I enjoyed this conversation, Samia. Uh, your vision uh, is certainly something that uh, uh, you're always uh, uh, illuminating new avenues and, and new ways of thinking new ideas. And I, I certainly also uh, appreciate very much the efforts that you have done over the years uh, to promote Arabic writing in many, many different ways and to have better understanding between the Arab world and, and uh, the world, the international community, the world at large. I'd also like to thank everyone who has participated uh, tonight. This has been a very enjoyable uh, uh, conversation and I have uh, really learned and, and enjoyed all your comments. Uh, I hope you'll join us uh, on the next conversation we'll be having uh, uh, 
in the new year. Thank you, uh, Ameni, and thank you, Mohammed, and thank you all for being there and for taking the time to listen and to participate. And uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night.